Hello, everyone. Sorry about that beginning. As you can tell, it's not the usual sort of slick procedure, although, I mean, uh, Ruth and Anna have been doing an excellent job, but Theo's not well, unfortunately, so she's not steering us today. Um, here we are, Centre for Yoga Studies, Sir Centre for Yoga Studies, and it gives me great pleasure today to be introducing Simon Atkinson, who's going to be talking to us about uh, his recent book, Krishnamacharya on Kundalini. Uh, Simon Atkinson's been practising and studying yoga uh, in the broad tradition following Krishnamacharya since the early 1990s, and also learning Sanskrit for more than 20 years, and teaches academic English and academic skills at the University of Cambridge. Um, and we, so we're, we're, we're in this webinar format now on Zoom. So Simon's going to give his talk, but if anyone's got questions, they can put them in on the Q&A in the Zoom, and I will collate those at the end. And if you want, I think we can, can we go to people? I can't remember. Can we go to people? If, yeah, if they, if they want to speak their questions, we can. Otherwise, I shall uh, read them out. And with that, over to you, Simon, to talk to us about Krishnamacharya on Kundalini. Okay, well, thank you very much, Jim, and thank you for this opportunity. It's a great pleasure to be speaking to SOAS in particular for really several reasons. So firstly, I used to work at SOAS until about 2013, just before Jim joined, I think, uh, almost exactly just before Jim joined SOAS. Uh, and I also started uh, learning Sanskrit at SOAS in the language center at SOAS with Usha Mehta. So that was, that was even longer ago. Uh, and also I used the SOAS library as part of my research for writing this book. So it feels very natural to be connecting with SOAS and giving something back. So a big thank you to SOAS for all of the tuition on Sanskrit and the use of the library. Uh, okay, so let me share my screen. Okay, so today I'm going to be giving you a bit of a summary of my book, Krishnamacharya on Kundalini, which was published in May 2022 by Equinox Publishing in the UK. So it's about Krishnamacharya and his ideas. Tirumalai Krishnamacharya was born in what is now modern day Karnataka in the south of India in 1888, and he died in about in 1989, aged 100. He's very well known in the world of yoga. He doesn't need much introduction. He's often called the father of modern yoga because his influence has been absolutely huge, especially in the West and maybe especially in the English speaking world. So his main students, I mean, he's had many students over the years, but his main students were BKS Iyenga and Patabi Joyce, who studied with him in Mysore uh, before the Second World War. And then he moved from Mysore to Chennai in, in uh, Tamil Nadu, then called Madras. And when he was in Madras, his main students were TKV Desikachar, his son or one of his sons, A.G. Mohan and Srivatsa Ramaswamy. So I'd like to say at this point that I respect all of these teachers. I guess my respect for Iyengar and Joyce is a little bit more distant because I've never studied yoga in their traditions. I've never benefited from their teachings. I just know that they're very well-respected, solid yoga teachers. Uh, with Desikachar Mohan and Ramaswamy, my respect is a little bit more immediate because I've been taught by all of them and I've very much benefited from their teachings. I still consider myself to be practicing in their tradition and their approach to yoga has numerous benefits, numerous merits to it. So I feel very lucky to have been taught in this tradition. When I tried to get my head around the question of what is Kundalini and what is Krishnamacharya's teachings on Kundalini, it seemed very natural uh, to look to what Desikachar Mohan and Ramaswamy had said on the subject. So I am going to give an academic presentation, and my book is an academic book, and it contains quite a lot of critical analysis. But I'd like, to, I'd like to emphasize that I respect these teachers and I actually even like them. Uh, so I've met Dizik Char, Mohan and Ramaswamy, I've shaken their hands, and with Mohan I've had individual private conversations. So if I give any criticism of their ideas or their translations or their teachings, 
then I'm not implying any criticism uh, of their character or personality because I admire them and I like them, okay? Uh, but I'm applying my academic skills of critical analysis to try to investigate this complex topic and find out what Krishnamacharya's ideas were, where they came from, and how well they actually come together, how coherent they are. So, well, having said all that, what was Krishnamacharya's position on Kundalini? Well, he was asked in an interview, does Kundalini rise through the Shashamna to Sahasrara, which is on the, on the crown of the head? And he replied, no, it is the Pranavayu that moves through the Shashamna. Uh, so according to Desikachar, uh, to Krishnamacharya, Kundalini was a blockage, the nucleus of imbalance in the body. It's also called Shakti because its power is so great that it is able to block the flow of prana into the Shashamna. Through proper practice, it was released to permit the flow of prana. So this is greatly in contrast to the more usual teachings found in modern yoga, in which Kundalini is an energy that rises up through the chakras to the top of the head. Krishnamacharya taught that no, it's the prana that rises up through the chakras to the top of the head, Kundalini is a blockage that prevents the prana from going into the Shashamna and rising. Okay, so how am I going to divide up the rest of today's talk? Well, I'm firstly going to talk about the Yogi Yanyavalkya, which was Krishnamacharya's main source text on Kundalini. And then I'll briefly uh, outline how those teachings in the Yogi Yanyavalkya can be found in other Vaishnava texts particularly from the traditions of temple priests known as Pranjaratra and Vaikarnasa. Uh, I'll also outline another of my chapters in the book, which I call a union of yogas, and I'll give at least some indication of how Krishnamacharya linked Hatha Yoga and Patanjali Yoga through the idea of Kundalini. Also, I'll give a brief outline of another chapter in my book called The Symbolism of Serpents, in which uh, I argue how serpents can be used to represent something that needs to be overcome in a number of different ways, in a number of different traditions. And lastly, I'm going to be looking at what Vedanta Deshika said on Kundalini. Vedanta Deshika was a very prominent Sri Vaishnava teacher from the 13th and 14th centuries, and I will evaluate some quotations that have been attributed to him on Kundalini. Okay, so let's begin with the Yogayanya Valkya. So as I say, it's Krishnamacharya's source text on Kundalini, and according to TKV Desikachara, he said, <clears throat> my explanations are based on what I think is the best, classic and most straightforward text, the Yogayanya Valkya. I think the explanation found in it is more coherent than any other I know. And that was when Desikachar was talking specifically about Kundalini. And by the way, uh, that, is, that is backed up by uh, Mohan and Srivatsarama Swami saying exactly the same thing, that uh, the Yogyan Yavalki was Krishnamacharya's main text on Kundalini. And it, it, there's quite a lot of repetition in the text on Kundalini because uh, Kundalini and related concepts are mentioned in chapters 4, 6, and 12. So one point in the Yogyanya Valkya is the location of Kundalini. So normally Kundalini is located at Muladhara Chakra, or more usually in modern teachings at least, it's located at Muladhara Chakra at the base of the spine, or maybe in the perineum. But in the Yogi Yanyavalkya, that is not the case. So I'm going to present several quotations here. And yeah, if I give a translation without any reference, then that is my own translation. Okay. So Kundalini is always seated or encamped at Nabi, always situated at Nabi, dwelling in the Nadis in the middle of the Kanda. Well, Nabi chakra is in the middle of the Kanda, so that makes some sort of sense. Uh, Kundalini is in the middle of Nabi, and then 421 says, obliquely above Nabi is the place of Kundalini. So that's a slight variation. Uh, Kundalini is always constantly present around and on the sides of the Kanda, completely blocking the pathways of air, water, food, etc. 
So it's interesting that it doesn't just block prana, in other words, air, it blocks water and food as well. Uh, and in the Yogi Yanyavalkya, Nabi chakra is the lowest chakra. Uh, so there, there is no Svadhisthana and Muladhara chakra in the Yogi Yanyavalkya. So therefore it makes sense that Kundalini is located at Nabi, given that that is the lowest chakra. So Kundalini tends to be located at the lower entrance to the Shushumna in various different texts, in various different systems. But in the Yogi Anyavalgya, Kundalini is a blockage. So again, these are my translations. Kundalini has the form of eight prakritis and is coiled eight times in a spiral. She always completely blocks the pathways of air, water, food, etc., around and on the sides of the Kanda, and completely covers the opening of Brahmarandra, the entrance to the Shishamna, with her mouth. So she's a blockage. Having covered or blocked the Shishamna with her mouth and other nadis with her hood, holding her own tail in her mouth, Kundalini restrains or constrains the path of gathered prana. But Kundalini blockage can be awoken using Agni and prana, so using fire and air. So by this dharana established from the center of Nabi, the prana goes to the Kundalini and burns it there without a doubt. There in Nabi, heated by fire and caused to move by Vayu, Kundalini by herself then awakens. Her hood and the body bearing it are spread. So her hood spreads and her body straightens as she wakens up. And then after Kundalini has been woken up, Prana and Agni then rise. So when Kundalini has been awoken, that which is called Prana moves in this chakra at the root of Nabi and goes along the Shishamna towards Brahmarandra at the top of the head. So yeah, so that's, that's fairly straightforward so far, uh, but I'm going to uh, look at some translations by TKV Desikachar uh, on various verses of the Yogi Anyavalkya, uh, and I'm going to challenge some of his translations. So, I mean, I, I pay particular attention to Desikachar Mohan and Ramaswamy as two of the longest standing students of Krishnamacharya, because I want to know how the Yogi Anyavalki was interpreted in line with Krishnamacharya's teachings. Uh, but I find some things that I really can't go along with. So in verses 665 to 666, Desikachar says, whoever remains in this practice and focuses on the location of Shakti at Muladhara. Well, I'm not going to read through my entire translation of the same verses. I guess if you watch this on YouTube later on, you'll be able to pause it and read them at your leisure. Uh, or of course, you can read these translations in my book. But my point is that Desikachar is introducing Muladhara when it's not in the text. So he's locating Kundalini at Muladhara, perhaps interpreting the Yogi Anyavalkya in line with other generally later texts, which do locate Kundalini at Muladhara. He mentions Muladhara several times. So in another verse, uh, the eight petal lotus whose center is yellow is the place of highest learning. Rising from Muladhara, the Nadi reaches Nabi. Well, that is not in the Sanskrit. Uh, in another place, he says, uh, practicing thus, praying to the divine while reciting pranava with the power of prana, bringing it from Muladhara to Brahmarandra. Well, the, the Sanskrit in question seems to be pranam ud mulayet, which you can translate as must be eradicated or uprooted. I translated it as the yogi should pull up the prana by the root. So just because we have mula in mula yet doesn't mean muladhara chakra. It just means the end of the shashumna from, from the root. Pull it up completely by the root. So in total, Desikachar gives five mistranslations and two misleading footnotes, which misrepresent the Yogi Anyavalkya. He extends the Shishumna down from Nabi chakra, which is the terminus, the lower terminus of the Shishumna in the Yogi Anyavalkya, down to Muladhara, perhaps to bring it in line with other texts. 
and he relocates Kundalini from Nabi to Mulatara. In contrast, an essay by Krishnamacharya on Kundalini says Kundalini is found above and below Nabi Chakra. Well, that's very much in line with the various locations of Kundalini in the Yogi Anyavalkya, but it doesn't agree with Desikachar's presentation of that text. Okay, there's another verse which is very interesting and opens up uh, maybe a hole in the integrity of the coherence of the Yogi Anyavalkya with regard to Kundalini just being a blockage only. So in 1217, this is my translation of it. When by this, which is meditating on flames in the heart, Vayu together with the friend of Vayu, in other words, fire, is restricted in the center of the heart, the snake Dvijikva, having entered the mouth of the thousand petaled lotus, should make the face of that lotus rise upwards again. Well, if we look at the translation by Mohan and Mohan, so this is A.G. Mohan, who was one of Krishnamacharya's longstanding students and with his son Ganesh Mohan. Then their translation says, by this, when the Vayu along with the Agni is stuck in the center of the heart, it enters the opening of the thousand petal heart lotus and must be made to face upwards again. Well, if we look at some aspects of this, uh, the, what I translate as the thousand petal lotus, Sahasra Patrasya, then I would say that that Sahasra on the top of the head, whose very name means a thousand, whereas Mohan seems to translate it as a thousand petal heart lotus, even though the heart lotus is given eight petals earlier on in verse 9, 12 of the Yogi Yanyavakya. So that's a little bit curious. The second thing that I would challenge in his translation is Dvij Dvijikra. So the snake Dvijikva hadn't entered the mouth of the thousand petal lotus. Well, I would argue that from the context, Dvijikva literally means two tongued. Dvi meaning two, Jikva meaning tongue. So the English equivalent is fork tongued. It's the fork tongued of a snake. So this is a snake entering the thousand petal lotus. It looks like Kundalini has risen to the top of the head. So Mokan doesn't give any indication of that. Well, if we look at the uh, critical edition of the text, then this is verse 1217 at the bottom here. And Dvijikva is the last word of that. But if we look at the notes to verse 1217 on the next page, so this is 18, 19, 20, and these are the notes to 1217, then we find if we look at the different manuscripts in, in this, I should have said this is the critical edition by Divanji from 1954. So if we look at the notes of the critical edition, then we find that there are only two manuscripts that actually contain Dvijikva. In contrast, there are 10 manuscripts and five previously published editions of the Yogi Anyavakya that contain a different word Dvijendre, and there are some other variations on that as well. So it could be argued that there's actually a, a good case for saying that instead of Dvijikva, which is what the critical edition uses, there's a good case from these 10 manuscripts and five printed editions to say, to say that the word should have been Dvijendre instead. Well, I've given three different alternative location, uh, translations here. The, the top one is what I just showed a few moments ago using Dvijekva. If we use Dvijendre, then I can think of two possible translations of that. One might be in the moon. So the moon could, could possibly be a synonym for Chandra, which is used later on in the same texts. However, I'm a bit more convinced by using uh, another translation of saying in the best among the twice born. So there's a very similar form of the word used elsewhere in the text. So whichever one we actually use, then we would have to come up with another translation to say that it's not a snake moving up to the thousand petal lotus. However, if we look at uh, the translation, if we look at the text that is given by A.G. Mohan 
and Ganesh Mohan, then there is no mention of, of David Chikpa in their text. They substitute David Jendre, but in their translation, which was here in their translation, they don't attempt any translation of David Jendre. So I think that from the critical edition, as I said, there's a good case for saying that the word should have been Dvijendre instead of Dvijikva, but I would argue that Mohan should have openly declared that in his translation, rather than just changing the critical edition, which he previously stated was error-free. So there's various possibilities about how these different manuscripts came about. Uh, I guess one possibility is that the original was the was that uh, Kundalini was a blockage only, and then later editions of the text, later manuscripts may have introduced the idea of Kundalini rising to the top of the head as, as Dvijekva, or it could have been the other way around. There could have been a remnant of teachings in which Kundalini is a mobile energy, and then when that was incorporated into the Yogyanya Valkya, it could have gradually been phased out by later revisions, later redactions of the text, which tried to get rid of the mobile nature of Kundalini. So I argue in my book that a lot of these teachings that eventually found their way into the Yogyanya Valkya originally came from Shaiva Tantra, so Kashmir Shaivism, and then they were remolded and reformulated into various uh, Vaishnava traditions, which I'll come to in a minute. Okay, so we've mentioned about Kundalini. Uh, there is also the question of Agni. Where is, where is Agni located in the Yogyani Valkya? Well, it's in the Perineo. Whoops. My keyboard has just stopped working. Okay, in the Dehamadya, so the, the Dehamadya is the center of the body, uh, is a place of flame, splendid like molten gold. In men, the Dehamadya is two angulars above the anus and two angulars below the penis in the middle of these two. So the private place, the perineum. In the Kandastana is not, sorry, the Kandastana is nine angulars above the Dehamadya and is four angulars in height and width. In the middle of the Kandastana is Nabi and in Nabi is a chakra. Twelve spokes are joined to it and by the body is held up. So this locates the Kanda and therefore Nabi in relation to the Dehamadya and Agni being located there. And Agni is also in the Perineum in the same place in the Yogi and Nivalkya, the Vasishta Samhita, which shares a huge number of verses with the Yogi and Nivalkya. Also the Padma Samhita, which we'll come to in a moment, and the Ahirbunya Samhita. So, the Padma Samhita and Ahirbunya Samhita are both from the tradition of Pancharatra. Uh, it's also, Agni is also in the perineum in the Garaksha Shataka and Garaksha Padati. But DKV Desgachar relocated Agni from the perineum to the navel, and he relocated Kundalini from the navel to the perineum. So, why did he do that? Well, I've already indicated that one reason maybe to try to interpret the Yogi and Yuvalkya in line with other texts, generally later texts, in which Kundalini is located at Muladhara Chakra. But there could be another reason. So let's consider the, the position of Kundalini and Agni in standing and in inverted postures. So here, so this is TKV Desikachar's teachings, is that Kundalini is at the base of the spine in Muladhara, and Agni is in the belly. If we go into an inversion, then TKV Desigachar teaches that the, that the flame of the fire always points upwards. So now having the Kundalini above the fire means that the fire is more easily able to burn the Kundalini. And that's one of the justifications for inverted postures. However, in C, we have the teachings of the Yogi and Yavalkya. So Agni is in the perineum and Kundalini is in Nabi. If we go into an inverted posture, 
then if we accept the argument that the flames of the fire point upwards, then they're pointing away from the Kundalini. So it would tend to not support inverted postures. And I think it's interesting, the use of Mula Banda in these inverted postures. So according to TKV Deskachar, we use Mula, Mula Banda in an inverted posture to take the Kundalini downwards towards Agni, excuse me. Uh, in contrast, Srivastra Ramaswamy, when teaching about the Yogi Yanyaralkya, he taught that we use Mula Banda to take the Agni down to Kundalini. So note firstly that in the Yoga Yanyavalkya there are no inverted postures. So this is an inference of Srivatsa Ramaswami. Uh, notice also that the two teachers are actually teaching the same practice using Mula Bandha in an inverted posture, but they're justifying it in a different way. So I would just question at this point, and maybe we can come back to this later. I would question, are these teachings about the nature and location of Kundalini and Agni actually uh, existential facts? Are they an objective existential fact or are we talking about something else? Maybe a sort of metaphor that we can use to guide our practice. So maybe we can come back to that later on. Okay, moving to another text, the Hatha Pradipika by Svadmarama is often called the Hatha Yoga Pradipika uh, especially in the tradition following Krishnamacharya. And according to Desikachar, it contains contradictory descriptions of Kundalini. Well, one question is what goes up in the Hattapadipika? So I'll give various verses. So in one verse, it's prana which flies up. In another verse, apana is made to go upwards by Mulabanda. Uh, in another verse, the sleeping Kundalini is a is awoken like a snake hit with a stick it hisses and straightens like a snake entering its burrow it enters the brahmanadi in other words the shishumna so kundalini goes into the shishumna and kundalini rises forcefully and kundalini is drawn upwards somewhat well i guess it depends what we mean by somewhat how far up the shishumna does the kundalini go i can't find any statement in the Hatha Pradipika that Kundalini actually rises to the top of the head. Uh, but it depends, well, how, how far up is some what? So another key verse in the Hatha Pradipika is 314. Uh, and it, it's talking about Mahamudra, uh, and it says great kleshas, doshas, uh, death, etc., are reduced or destroyed by that practice, and the best sages call it Mahamudra. Well, if we look at the commentary on the Hatha Pradipika by Brahmananda, then he says that the great kleshas are avidya, asmita, rava, dvesha, adinivesha. So that's exactly the same kleshas presenting, presented in exactly the same order as in Patanjali 2.3. So that helps Krishnamacharya's tradition to argue that Kundalini is effectively a vidya. So this opens up a whole load of connections that can be made between Hatha Yoga and Patanjali Yoga. So in an interview with Krishnamacharya, he was questioned, there are many approaches to the word yoga, which of these have to be refuted? And he answered, Adharmaka Yoga has to be refuted. What is Adharmaka Yoga? Adharmaka Yoga is the yoga that's not being mentioned in the Yoga Sutra. Well, Kundalini is not in the Yoga Sutra, but Avidya is. So if we equate Kundalini and Avidya, it, it, it enables many connections, many equivalents to be drawn between these different texts. So according to Desikachar, in the same way that Avidya has become so powerful that it stops Purusha from seeing, Kundalini blocks prana from entering the shashumna. The moment avidya is not there is the same moment that Kundalini is removed. Then prana enters the shashumna. As it enters, it rises slowly to the top. That is why this is also part of Raja Yoga. Raja Yoga is the process in which the prana, which is the friend of Purusha, little by little ascends to the top, and then the man is like a king, a master. 
So it's worth mentioning here that to Krishnamacharya and his students, Raja Yoga is the same as Patanjali Yoga. Raja Yoga is the Yoga Sutra. Not every tradition teaches that, and Raja Yoga was originally something different, but that is what is taught in this tradition. Raja Yoga is Patanjali. So Desikachar continues, whatever happens to the state of mind happens to the whole person. That is the basis in the Yoga Sutra. In various yogas, the same thing is stated in different ways, that is all. The results are the same because these are merely interpretations of the same thing. Mohan says something very similar. So the Kundalini blocking or covering, covering the opening to the Brahmarandra, the dot of freedom, at the bottom of the Shishumna Nadi, refers to the scene, Prakriti, binding the seer and blocking its way to freedom. Bound to the scene, the seer is unable to ascend to its true abroad at the Brahmarandra. So this is just a quick tip of the iceberg sample of the different ways in which uh, Patanjali Yoga and Hatha Yoga can be joined together and combined uh, by using this equivalence of Kundalini and Avidya. Okay, so yeah, I mentioned these texts a, a little bit earlier. The Yogi Anyavalkya uh, is, is thought by most scholars, not all, but by most scholars, to have got most of its verses from the Vashishta Samhita, which was slightly older. And then in turn, the Vashishta Samhita got some of its verses on Kundalini from the Padma Samhita, which is around 10th century uh, of the common era. And there's also the Arhebunya Samhita, which I explore in detail in my book, but I'm not going to talk about much here. That's also from the Pancharatra tradition. So the Padma Samhita and the Arhebunya Samhita do contain teachings that Kundalini is a blockage, but I'm going to show some verses in the, in the Padma Samhita which would complicate that. And in the Arhebunya Samhita, there's a variety of different conceptions of Kundalini. Kundalini is definitely a mobile, energetic thing uh, that's connected with the utterance of sounds. And that's a, an ancient tantric conception. So there's a variety of different conceptions of Kundalini in the Pancharatra canon. Uh, there's also closely related uh, tradition of Vaikanasa. So they were, these were rival uh, Vaishnava temple priests, uh, and they still operate a substantial number of the Vaishnava holy sites today, uh, including Tirupati. And this text, the Vimaranarjana Kalpa Samhita, also contains a passage in which Kundalini is a blockage only. So there were a lot of ideas in Vaishnava texts which presented Kundalini as a blockage but not all of them are completely consistent, as I show in my book. So let's look at the Padma Samhita. And Jim, you'll be pleased to know that I'm quoting your translation here, uh, your translation together with uh, Singleton. Uh, and just picking it up from later on. When during yoga, she has risen because of the breath together with fire, she, being Kundalini, bursts forth into the void of the heart in the form of the snake, blazing brightly. Well, okay, so if Kundalini is a blockage only, how can it enter the Shishunna? How can it rise as far as the heart? And what happens to it when it rises as far as the heart? Well, Krishnamacharya said this. He said that it rises to the space of the heart. So that's very much in line with the Padma Samhita and yeah, I should have pointed out that the verse that I just quoted from, from Mallinson and Singleton, that appears almost exactly in the Vashishta Samhita and in the Yoga Yanyavalkya Samhita. So Krishnamacharya seemed to be following those traditions which originated in the Padma Samhita, claiming that Kundalini is a blockage, but it travels till the space of the heart. Now, if we quote Kaust of Desikachar, who is Krishnamacharya's grandson, Kaustab Desgachar says that the Kundalini enters the middle passage only to be consumed by Jatar Agni. So this is 
fire of the belly region, fire of the stomach. So when this happens, the prana smoothly flows into this canal all the way up to the last chakra, and the yogin is in harmony. So it's quite clear that it's not the kundalini that rises all the way to the crown of the head, but prana. Okay, well, that's one explanation, but it doesn't seem to agree with what Krishnamacharya said. When Krishnamacharya was questioned, what happens to the kundalini when the highest of hatha yoga is mastered? He said, it is not explained in our shastras. Its position itself is disputed. In other words, where and what happens to the Kundalini is not clearly mentioned in the Shastras. So we can try to explain this, we can try to square the circle as much as we can, but I think Krishnamacharya is wisely quite open-minded about this, saying it's not really clear what happens, especially if we rely upon Vaishnava texts, which are not completely coherent and not completely uniform in their presentation of Kundalini. Okay, I'm moving on to another topic now. Uh, so I'm not going to say much about this chapter of my book because it doesn't really contain much that's directly based upon yoga texts, but it provides a useful contextual background in which conceptions of Kundalini can be located. So I call it the symbolism of serpents. This picture is of Naga stones in a temple in Tamil Nadu. There are hundreds of these Naga stones around the base of a tree. Uh, some of them show a single Naga. In other words, well, Nagas were semi-divine, semi-snake beings that are still worshipped in India. So some of them are single Nagas. Some of them are Nagas, snakes that are intertwined. And very often there are deities shown on these Naga stones. So yeah, this, the right hand side of this picture shows that these stones are actively worshipped largely by women and they're connected with fertility. Uh, if you do something to displease snakes by harming them in some way, it's said to cause a Naga dosha which affects fertility or can affect one's horoscope and cause nasty things to happen. But if you, if you worship snakes uh, and propitiate them, then you're, you're, you're uh, granted fertility. So if we look at the literature, I'm following here a book by Laurie Kozad, an excellent book called Sacred Snakes. So Kozad argues that in various different times of South Asian uh, literature, snakes are portrayed in two different ways, representing two streams of thought. Well, in the first stream of thought, snakes are powerful deities to be worshipped. They're presented quite positively and subsumed within the Hindu pantheon, within Hindu traditions. And I should say not just Hindu traditions, Buddhist traditions as well. Uh, and in the second stream of thought, snakes are malign beings that deserve to be killed. Well, I develop these ideas based upon Kozad's framework, and I've I've looked at a range of different texts in Advaita Vedanta, Vishishta Advaita Vedanta, Vaishnavism, legal texts, the epics, the Vedas, a whole range of different texts. And I've identified a number of different ways in which snakes represent something to be overcome. So firstly, they represent Maya or illusion. They represent a vidya, which is sometimes called nescience or false spiritual vision. Anyana, in Advaita Vedanta, anyana and avidya are pretty much synonymous, not so in Patanjali, but I think in the examples that I quote, anyana also represents false spiritual vision. Snakes can also represent ahamkara or ego, ahamana or egotism. They can represent abhimana, erroneous self-conception, mana, pride, moka, delusion. There's, snakes are widely uh, connected with poison for obvious reasons. Snakes sometimes represent samsara, and you know, samsara being uh, rebirth, the cycle of rebirth. And in many examples, crucially, they represent covering or binding. 
So I'm not going to give many examples of this. Uh, I'll just give one. So the Viveka Chudamani uh, is an Advaita text that is attributed to Shankara. So he says, the treasure of the bliss of Brahman is guarded by the terrible snake of ego, which possesses great strength, consists of three fierce heads representing the gunas, and envelops or surrounds or covers the Atman. Having completely destroyed the illusory snake with three heads with the splendid great sword known as wisdom, the wise one is able to enjoy this treasure, which gives happiness. So the important thing is that we have a snake of ego, it has three fierce heads that represent the gunas, and it envelops or surrounds or covers the Atman, which is in the heart. So teachings about the Shashumna go back to early Upanishads. I think it was first called, called the Shashumna in the Maitri Upanishad. And the Shashumna goes from the heart only up to the top of the head. In the Viveka Chudamani, then that is still the case, but the heart is wrapped around, covered by a snake. I would argue that that is comparable to the Yogi and Yavalkya, in which the Shashumna is extended downwards from the heart down to Nabi, and then the entrance to Nabi is covered by a snake. So I would say that these are not the same teachings, but there seems to be an evolution of teachings in which snakes represent something to be overcome and represent, in this case, covering. So I present many other examples in my book. I'm not going to go into them now. So the final topic that I want to cover today uh, is quotations from Vedanta Deshika. So this photograph here was taken in Kanchipuram. So it was taken in the branch of an ashram uh, outside of the temple where Vedanta Deshika was born. So he is the central figure here, of course. And he lived in the 13th and 14th centuries, which incidentally is roughly the time in which the Yogi Yanyavalkya was written. So it's the same sort of time frame. I'm pretty, pretty confident that, that, that uh, Vedanta Deshika did not write the Yogi Yanyavalkya for reasons which I hope will become apparent. But he was quoted by TKV Desikachar on the subject of Kundalini. So firstly, according to Vedanta Deshika, the Brahma Nadi is the location of Kundalini. It's called the 101st Nadi. Secondly, according to Vedanta Deshika, the grace of the Lord is a must for the prana to enter Shashumna after the Kundalini is reduced. Well, I took these quotations very seriously, and I was trying to establish whether the teachings of Kundalini as a blockage only went back to Sri Vaishnavism. So it seemed quite plausible because one of the big influences on Sri Vaishnavism was Pancharatra. So if Vedanta Deshika had been following Pancharatra teachings on this, then that might have influenced him. So I searched quite a lot for where these quotations might have come from. So yeah, if we go to the Brahma Sutra 4216, then it discusses what happens at the time of death and how the Atman can rise up through the Shashumna. So due to yogic remembrance on the passage, so the passage being the Shashumna, for those who are allowed to escape and due to the efficacy of knowledge, the jiva is favored with kindness, that abode shines from the top and that doorway is illuminated. So the jiva exits through the Nadi beyond 100 or the 101st Nadi. So the use of the phrase 101st Nadi predated Vedanta Deshika. If we look at Ramanuja's commentary on that Brahma Sutra, his Sri Bhashna, then he says the wise one departs the body via the 101st Nadi at the crown of the head, etc. Uh, the wise one does not make the wrong decision and enter another Nadi. The wise one is a consequence of knowledge which is dear to the Supreme Person and fit for his propitiation and due to the yogic remembrance of the passage to the Atman's escape, by the affectionate grace of the Supreme Person, the wise one is favored. And therefore that abode of the jiva, the heart place is illuminated, flaming at the top. 
Due to the favor of the supreme person, the doorway is illuminated. The wise one identifies that Navi and by it he goes into the passage. So there's certainly a mention of the 101st Nadi, and there's certainly a lot of emphasis upon the grace of the Lord, so grace of Vishnu, who allows the jiva to depart from the body at the time of death. So this contrasts with Hatha Yoga, in which firstly the yogin is actually still alive when he's trying to achieve this, uh, and secondly the entrance into the Shishamna tends to be uh, achieved by the effort of the yogi, not the grace of the Lord. But these are very interesting ideas. And this was Ramanuja. I wondered whether Vedanta Deshika had actually combined this teaching with elements of Pancharatra, which could have said that the Kundalini was a blockage for the jiva to actually go into the Shashamna. So that's what I was looking for. I examined 11 of Vedanta Deshika's texts, which cover this verse of the Brahma Sutra, or cover the topic of those verses. So some of these texts are very well known. Rahasya Trayasaram, this is his main text, his magnum opus. Uh, and other of these texts are a little bit more obscure. So I should say that Vedanta Deshika wrote more than 100 texts. He was really very prolific. Uh, so it's difficult to be completely authoritative, but I found these texts which, which at least discuss this topic. So I'm only going to give a quotation from one of them, the Adhikara Nasara Vali. Uh, so it's a notable feature in this text that uh, he, Vedanta Deshika seems to be extending the Shashamna down from the heart uh, down to Nabi. So let's read through it. In a very subtle web of Nadis, it is not easy to discern the way of the liberation Nadi by the effort of the one being released. Pleased with the knowledge of the seeker of liberation, with great grace and kindness, Vishnu deeps him fit to enter the Nadi. Together with and possessing, and possessing another who is perfect in herself, in other words, Lakshmi, the all-knowing one, Vishnu, purifier of seven worlds, dwell, dwelling concealed in the center of the heart lotus, having opened the Nadi called Shashamna, which supports the whole form from Nabi to the top of the head, and having thrown up that middle road, the one desiring liberation like an arrow that has been shot, Vishnu will lead him. So it still emphasizes the role of Vishnu in causing the jiva of, of the yogi uh, to, to enter into the shashamna and rise up to the top of the head. But he just extends the shashamna from the heart down to Nabi. That's the only, the only indication that I can find of Pancharatra influence. I also looked at the Pancharatra Raksha, which TKV Desikachar claimed to be an authoritative, important text on Kundalini. It doesn't mention Kundalini at all. I say more in my book. I also examine the Garuda Panchashat. So Garuda is the avian vehicle, the bird vehicle of Vishnu on which he flies around. And Garuda was a bird who is depicted as eating snakes, definitely. Uh, and in the Garuda Panchashat, he's shown de decorated with snakes. So this is, a, this is a terracotta figurine outside of a temple in Chennai. Uh, but in the Garuda Panchashat, the snakes certainly don't represent Kundalini Shakti, and they certainly don't represent an obstacle to be overcome. So I found one text in which Kundalini is mentioned in the correct context, in other words, to do with nadis and chakras, etc., in, in terms of Hatha Yoga. So the Sankalpa Suryodaya is an allegorical morality play. So in this play, there are different there are two opposing teams, essentially. Purusha is heading towards liberation. And on the one side, there are positive spiritual qualities, which do battle with negative spiritual qualities. And towards the end, as Purusha approaches liberation, there is an important declaration by Vishnu Bhakti. So this is the, this is the Sanskrit of Vishnu Bhakti speaking. Now, at first, when I read this, I thought Mandaline Kundaline, 
these are in the same number, they are in the same case, this must be part of the same phrase of the Sanskrit, but I was misled, uh, I made a mistake with that. So instead there are three gerunds ending in ya, nirutya, vichintya, and viganaya. And I've color coded them according to the phrases that they seem to go with. So this is my translation. What is the use of having restrained by mental strength the assemblage of pranas and sense organs, having meditated on the Kundalini Nadi, having counted the Nadis, Datus, Marma points, etc., of being established in the three Vedas, only if absorbed in steady application to me is he said to be released? Okay, well, you may have noticed in green, I said, having meditated on the Kundalini Nadi. Well, why did I put in Nadi in square brackets? That's not actually in the original text that Vedanta Deshika wrote. If we look at commentaries on the Sankalpa Suryodaya, we find that it is interpreted as a Nadi. So, Nusimha Raja's commentary, Kundali is a Nadi called Kundala. So in other words, you could say a sinuous nadi, a nadi that's not straight, a nadi that has serpentine form. Ahobala's commentary from maybe a little bit early, Kundali is the Shumna nadi. And then another commentary from the 20th century by a very well-respected contemporary of Krishnamacharya says, Kundali is a special nadi near to Nabi. So this seems to clearly equate Kundalini or Kundalini, which are the same thing, with Shashumna. So I think different, different Vaishnava traditions seem to have reinterpreted Kundalini, which is originally a Shaiva concept, they've reinterpreted it in different ways. So sometimes they interpret Kundalini as just a blockage to the Shashumna here, in Sri Vaishnavism, for centuries they've interpreted Shashumna as being Kundalini, or they've interpreted Kundalini as being Shashumna, another name for Shashumna. In other texts, like the Srimad Bhagavatam, we have essentially Kundalini Yoga, or Hatha Yoga in which energy rises, and Kundalini just isn't mentioned. So there seems to be some diversity in the ways in which Vaishnava traditions have reinterpreted an originally Shaiva concept of Kundalini. But if we revisit Deskachar's quotations from Vedanta Deshika, then according to Vedanta Deshika, the Brahma Nadi is the location of Kundalini. It is called the 101st Nadi. While it's not the location of Kundalini, in the Sankalpa Suryodaya, the Shashamna is Kundalini or Kundalini. Second alleged quotation, According to Vedanta Deshika, the grace of the Lord is a must for the prana to enter Shashamna after the Kundalini is reduced. Well, if we delete after the Kundalini is reduced, then that would be a decent summary of Vedanta Deshika's position. He does teach that the grace of the Lord is the must for the prana and other aspects of the subtle body to enter the Shashamna, but he does not say after the Kundalini is reduced. So, yeah. I, I didn't look at every possible text on this, uh, but I did meet uh, with the 12th Swami of the Andaban Ashram, Sri Matri Varaha Mahadeshika Swami, who basically uh, confirmed the conclusion that I've just come to. Vedanta Deshika did not write that Kundalini is a blockage to Shashamra. Okay, nevertheless, TKB Deskachar and Kaustab Deskachar claim that all texts confirm that it is the prana that indeed moves into the Shashamna, beginning at the Muladhara chakra and terminating at Sahasrara chakra, and not the Kundalini. Well, that is not true. There are many texts in which Kundalini does rise to the top of the head, uh, the, and even in the Yogi and Yavakya, uh, the, the Kundalini, uh, so, sorry, the prana rises from Nabi chakra to the top of the head, not from Mulatara chakra. So that, that quotation is inaccurate. So TKV Desikachar and Kaustub Desikachar seem to be quite insistent on Krishnamacharya's position that Kundalini is a blockage only. 
but they don't represent the whole of the tradition. In contrast, A.G. Mohan is a lot more circumspect. So Krishnamacharya told Mohan the following. Uh, so these are from notes that Mohan wrote when being told they had to Pradipika. He wrote, my guru differs, differs with Swatmarama, prana moves up, not kundalini. So he's recognizing that texts teach different things. The goal in Hatha Yoga is to burn the kundalini. In Shakta traditions, it is to awaken the kundalini. We use prana to move kundalini. In the Shakta tradition, kundalini is considered the deity of prana. The approach there is different. In the Geranda Samhita, due to the practice of Shakti Chanana, the serpent Kundalini, feel, feeling suffocated, awakes and rises upwards to the Brahma Randra. So Mohan is acknowledging that there are different conceptions, but the emphasis of his teaching, in my experience, indicates that he subscribes to Krishnamacharya's view that Kundalini is a blockage of Hanvi. Similarly, with Srivatsa Ramaswamy, he's similarly open minded. Uh, he presents three alternative accounts. So, one in which Kundalini is a vidya in Vedanta, in, one, in which one should overcome illusion. Secondly, in Tantra, Shakti rises to Shiva in the top of the head, which implies the equation of Shakti and Kundalini. And in Krishnamacharya's interpretation of Hatha Yoga, the agenda is to destroy Kundalini, which represents a vidya. Well, I would say number one and number three are very compatible. Uh, but his conclusion is this, decide which approach is palatable to you and practice that. So it's notable that Ramaswamy uh, was not from a Vaishnava background. So conclusion, what, what, can we, what can we draw together from what I've said today? Bearing in mind that what I've presented is really only the tip of an iceberg, there's much more in my book. So firstly, Krishnamacharya's position did not come from Vedanta Deshika and Sri Vaishnavism. It came from the Yogi Yanyavalkya. The Yogi, the Yogi Yanyavalkya draws from Pancharatra and Vaikanasa traditions, uh, in between which there was a lot of interchange, apparently. Snakes often represent something to be overcome. And I would, I would argue that Krishnamacharya's conception of Kundalini as a blockage also represents something to be overcome. So that chapter outlines how that view of Kundalini fits in with a wider stream of thought in South Asian traditions. However, not all texts teach the same thing about Kundalini. There's widely different accounts in different texts. But Krishnamacharya used Kundalini to link Hatha Yoga with Patanjali and form the type of yoga that is widely practiced today in this tradition. So yeah, I haven't really said too much about this. I hinted at it earlier, but I would say that Krishnamacharya's position should be regarded as a model for experience. It shouldn't be regarded as a definitive statement about something which is objectively existentially true it should be regarded as a model which can shed some light on our experience and guide our practice so i think i've over overrun a little bit guys uh, thank you for being so tolerant uh do we have some time left for questions have we had any questions coming in jeff we do, Simon. Thank you very much. That was great. A real sort of uh, distillation, the, the sara of your of your book. But as you say, there's a lot more, many more treasures in there. And um, we've got a couple of questions in the Q and A. But you know, um, please okay. do ask some more. I've got a couple though. Well, I've got lots, but I should probably <laughs> right. usual. Um, yeah, I really like the way you look at the snake law. You know, to show that the blockage. Uh, understanding of the snake is, I think, you know, it's very really convincing that that's a much more likely, um, a likely understanding of, of what Kundalini is up to at the opening of the channel. And, it, you know, there's all these ideas, I think, as well, that you probably look into it, or I think you do, but it's a while since I looked at the, you know, the way snakes guard holes that have treasures in and that sort of thing. So you've got to get past them. And I think that yeah. really makes good sense. So I'm just wondering if you've got 
uh, idea about how the the notion of kundalini actually rising came about i mean i, I you allude to that being in the shiva texts okay um, I wonder whether you've explored that i mean okay so well not 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 in any not in any great depth so i'm getting a little bit out of out of my depth here i guess with my book there was i've covered such a lot of ground that I really had to put the blinkers on to a large extent and just look at this tradition and things related to it. So my, my feeling is, and I argue this with some references in the book, that Kundalini seems to have emerged as a concept in Kashmir Shaivism. And there seem to be a variety of different conceptions in Kashmir Shaivism. One of them, as I mentioned, is connected with the production of sounds. So that seems to be a, an, an early thread of Tantra in which Kundalini is involved in the production of sounds. Uh, it, seemed, it, it, it seems from my very threadbare knowledge that Kundalini is a lot more mobile and to do with the movement of the breath up and down. And in various different uh, traditions, then there's more than one Kundalini. There's an upper and a lower, or maybe an upper and a lower and a middle. So it seems to me, and I think I quote Alexis Sanderson, in saying that a lot of the content of Pancharatra and probably Vaikanasa as well came from Kashmir Shaivism. So it seems to me that there's a variety of different conceptions of Kundalini that existed in Kashmir Shaivism. And if we're taking teachings from one tradition and reformulating them into another one, then there's got to be a process of editing or redaction. And it seems that that that, that has gone on informing the Pancharatra and probably Vaikanasa texts. But it seems to me that the editing and the redaction has been incomplete. And there, even though Kundalini is largely presented as a blockage, there are sort of holes in that picture that indicate remnants of an earlier teaching in which Kundalini was more mobile. So I'm sure that you know an awful lot more about Chaiva Tantra than I do, having studied with Alexis Sanderson yourself. But that, that's, that's the feeling that I get, uh, is that Pancharatra was reformulating these ideas. And I think also it relates to the conception of the goddess. So the goddess in Sri Vaishnavism is a consort. The goddess doesn't have the same sort of status as the goddess in Shaivism and that which then developed into the Shakta tradition. So maybe, maybe I'm not the correct person to really go into this. Maybe Raj Balkaram could, could tell you a lot more about goddess traditions and how this relates to that. But it seems to me that uh, the, the position of the goddess isn't really compatible with having a powerful, energetic, mobile Kundalini in Vaishnavism. Mm. Okay, thanks. Yeah, no, I think it's a good. But particularly the um, the the notion of uchara as well, the 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 sound raising up the set, rising up the central channel together with kundalini. I think that, in fact, as a student at SOAS, uh, Anna Gennaro, who's working on that, so I think that that might be a productive thread. I also sometimes wonder when I look at um, teachings on chandali in uh, Vajrayana traditions. There seem to be some strong parallels with uh, kundalini practice, but there's there's lots more to be looked into there. Um, I got what well, it's not really a question it's sort of comment stroke question as well um you you suggested I think it was looking at the Vasishta Sanghita that uh when Kundalini there is said to move that that's incompatible with her being a blockage but I wonder about that I mean couldn't she I mean the way I sort of visualize it is that she's coiled up like you showed in some of your diagrams she's coiled up at the opening to the central channel wherever that might be if that's at the yeah. heart navel or wherever and then she she straightens up so she moves so she, in that process she sort of moves upwards but as a result then there's more space for prana to go up the channel so i wonder what you think about that idea i mean i don't you know, so my point is i don't see that that her moving is necessarily moving in the sense that she straightens up is incompatible no, and, and i think that that's what the tradition would teach so so kundalini straightens and enters into the shishamna and then, according to the quotation I gave from Kaustav Deskachar, Kundalini is burnt in the stomach sort of area. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, that, that would be what, what is frequently taught in the tradition. Mm -hmm. But, I mean, what does it really mean? If Kundalini is a vidya, then can a vidya straighten out? Can a vidya travel along the shashamna? Can a vidya be, be burnt in a certain position? So, I think 
I don't, maybe I'm wrong here. Maybe I'm going against tradition. Uh, maybe I'm just plain wrong. But I don't regard these, these ideas as being objective existential facts. I would regard this as a sort of metaphysical modeling in which we can, well, or we can visualize these things, or we can think of them as though they are objective existential facts to try to explain our own experience and to try to guide our, our practice. But there are different models that work in different ways. And I'm, I'm not really, I'm not saying one person is wrong and another person is right. I'm not saying one model is right and another model is wrong. I'm just saying that there are different models. So it seems to be more convincing that there's an element originally coming from Kashmir Shaivism in which Kundalini is more mobile and energetic. And, that, and there's still elements of that in these texts that I've been discussing, in which, which largely present Kundalini as a blockage. So I, I, I don't think that it's entirely coherent. It can be presented as being coherent, but I, I don't find it really that convincing. Well, I agree. No, I mean, I think all, and all these things, they're all just metaphors for a mystical experience, are they? Aren't they? Which can be expressed. Yeah. In well, well, yeah, the, 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 they're metaphors, but I mean, uh, you know, I am the walrus, I am the walrus, I am the eggman. That's a metaphor, but, but does it really mean anything? Uh, these, are, these are metaphors that are part of a model. And I think that they're a little bit more, more meaningful than just a, a sort of metaphor by itself. So it's a question of how these things can be thought of or visualized or understood and how that explains your experience and then how it guides your practice. Great, thank you. Well, we've got a few questions in the Q&A here. The first one is, uh, what have we got? Uh, do you believe that John Woodruff is a reliable translator and interpreter of the source texts? <laughs> okay, well, I'm, I'm, I'm perhaps not the person to ask because, I, I mean, I'm not very familiar with many of the texts that he's translated. I've read through his translation of the uh, Shat Chakra Nirupana, uh, but I haven't actually been through it myself. And I mean, my Sanskrit isn't, isn't at your level, Jim. Uh, I'm not completely fluent. It takes me ages to translate things. So I really don't know. I mean, I've, I've seen other people write that he's not a reliable translator, but I don't have any direct experience of looking at that text myself and evaluating his translation. But what I would say is that that text is given an awful lot of prominence, the Shat Chakra and Nirupana, and, and it, it's only one text and it presents just one picture. It's one model, and it, it, it seems to be used as the foundation for saying, you know, this is the model, this is the description of the chakras, you know, six plus one chakras, uh, and, you know, everything else is just wrong. Well, I think it's only one narrow view of the chakras. But as, as to how good his translation is, I really don't know. Yeah, thanks. So as, you, as you say, it's hugely influential. I haven't looked at it for a while. I mean, he is meant to have collaborated with pundits in Calcutta, hasn't he? So... Hopefully they, they would have, between them, they should have managed a decent job. Now we've got a few questions here. There's one, so Siddharth Yadav, um, I don't know if we can, so I can't remember quite how we do It's probably going to be easiest if I read these out. So earlier in the presentation, Simon translated prana as air. If so, how does prana differ from vayu, which also refers to air? I'm asking because prana is generally taken as representing life energy permeating the cosmos. The prana within a body can supposedly be manipulated using breath, but is not equivalent to air. So, so yeah, anyway, what do you, what's the relationship between okay. prana, vayu, energy, air? What, how, how, what do you... What have you uh, okay, that's a very good question, and I'm not sure that I'm going to be able to produce a very good answer. So I think a lot of the time, prana and value seem to be used interchangeably. Uh, but I mean, it, it, I'm not really convinced that they're exactly the same thing, just in a, on an experiential level. So I think, you know, breathing is one thing, and then the experience of, that can be described as prana throughout the body is something different. 
And I'm not really convinced that they're exactly the same thing, but they're very often presented as being the same thing. So, yeah, I'd be willing to take another look at some of the texts that I've translated and reevaluate that, but I, I use them as pretty much interchangeable because I think that many of the traditions do. No, I agree. And there's a, there's a part there in the Amrita Siddhi, I think, which is something like uh, prano dehago vayuhu, or, or deha, I think there are variants dehajo, dehago, but it's basically just saying that prana is vayu in the body. So it's saying it's the same yeah. thing. Um, okay. Uh, now we've got Richa saying, hi, is it possible that this confusion between prana or kundalini rising is because of translation or semantic differences. Both prana and kundalini are called energies. Uh, so in either case, is it energy which is to be raised in order to clear the knots in the nadis? Okay, well, I'm not sure that it's just a difference in translation because different texts can be shown to say very different things. What I really think is that we have different models that try to explain experience. So in, in various texts in various different traditions, different things are said to be rising. So we have the jiva, we have, we have prana, we have kundalini, we have semen even in, in tantric traditions. So we're trying to produce some sort of a metaphysical model that describes how something is, is experienced as rising. And I think that essentially what the texts do is a job of metaphysical modeling in which they try to represent that in various different ways. And sometimes it's represented by Kundalini rising, sometimes it's represented by Prana rising, sometimes, as I showed in the, uh, in the Sri Vaishya and the uh, Vedanta Sutra, then we just have the jiva rising. So I think different texts are trying to represent something very similar in very different ways. So I, I don't think it's always just a difference in translation. I mean, I, I'm, I'm reminded of when I raised some of the uh, challenges that I, that I brought about to translations and somebody in the tradition just said, well, can't these things be interpreted differently? Well, I think in certain situations uh, we can look at we can look at one word in a translation and we can interpret it differently. So there's there's one word in in a translation uh, that I've interpreted differently from Jason Birch, uh, and I, I think that that's fine. I think his interpretation is perfectly fine and logical. I present another that that I think is also equally fine and logical. So there's a different way of translating something, a different way of interpreting something in the text but i think very often what we don't have is 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 different interpretations we just have mistakes being made yeah i, I agree thanks um okay uh well ruth ruth can't get on i don't know unless we can go to her live i'm not sure we can maybe we can ruth do you want to ask your question live will that work uh, yeah i think that will work Great. Hi. Thanks for your presentation. Really interesting. Um, I wondered about uh, just a really, really simple question. How would you define Kundalini? <laughs> OK, how many how many definitions do you want? Uh, OK, well, according to Krishnamacharya's conception, then Kundalini is equivalent to Avidya. It is it is the nescience, the spiritual ignorance, which prevents the prana from entering into the Shashamana. Do you want more? <laughs> I think I think that's it in a nutshell. So I think the 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 equation between Kundalini and Avidya is really important for joining together the Hatha Yoga tradition and the and the Raja Yoga tradition, so to speak, Tanjali Yoga. And I, I talk quite quite length in my in my book about the implications that that actually has in practice. Great, thanks. I think we've got time for one. I, I, any, you got a follow up there, Ruth? Or you good? I, I've got loads of follow ups, but um, I'll shut up and ask. <laughs> well, now's your now's your chance. You want to quickly throw something in, otherwise we've got. Well, I, 
I, I suppose that I suppose you've presented a lot of textual information, but you're saying that actually is, I want to know what your analysis is of the relationship between text and practice and how you're using textual data to sort of um, sort of argue quite specific points. Yeah. And, and how that how text can help us understand practice and vice versa and what this sort of textual analysis can show. OK, well, yeah. That's a good question. It's quite difficult to, to begin to answer it. So I would say that if we have some sort of metaphysical understanding about various processes happening in the body, then we can use that to try to explain or describe any experiences we have. And we can use it to try to work out what might happen if we do certain things in our practice. So, so it, 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 it's, a, it's a metaphysical version of physics, of was it working out what's going to happen if we change a certain aspect of our practice. But we need, to be, we need to be mindful that if we actually do that, then we're only basing it upon one particular model, one particular conception. So if we swap around ideas from, from different texts, for example, about the position of Kundalini and, and Nagni, then that might com completely change the logic of, of what we're doing in our practice. So I guess I'm, I guess I'm thinking about something quite, quite specific uh, that I mentioned in my book uh, connected with that. Uh, would you like something a bit more general or? No? Well, I mean, I, 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 end, I end my book in a particular way, very deliberately. Uh, if, if you've been very astute, then you may, you may notice that the final word of my book is practice. So I, so I, I end the conclusion by saying uh, that, that uh, Krishnamacharya's position on Kundalini should be regarded as a model and not an, ex, not an ontological model, but an experiential model, and its usefulness uh, sh should be evaluated by how well it describes experience and how well it guides practice. And if you want to know about, more about how it described my experience, you can look at another YouTube video in which I'm interviewed by Daniel Simpson, where I talk more about that. Thank you. Well, we've, we're over time. We've got, I mean, if, you, if you've got a minute, we've got one, Nico's asked a few questions, so we're going to get one of his, his act. That's okay. Um, okay that's fine. Slightly tricky. Why do you think Krishnamacharya was interested in holding this position about Kundalini and was not discussing its relation to Shaiva Tantra? Okay, that, that's a really great question. So I think we've got to empathize with Krishnamacharya because he was a very strict, ardent Vaishnava, Sri Vaishnava. And so the conceptions of Kundalini and Shaiva Tantra would have been unacceptable to him. So I've, I've already mentioned the nature of the goddess, so that's very different in Sri Vaishnavism. And it doesn't really work to have such a powerful goddess in a, in a Vaishnava tradition. But he couldn't completely ignore Kundalini because he was dealing with a vast range of different Hatha Yoga texts, some of which were Vaishnava, but some of which were Shaiva and even Shakta. So he had to choose some sort of a way of accommodating teachers on teachings on Kundalini. He could have just said that it's complete rubbish. I mean, he was very dismissive about certain Hatha Yoga techniques. Kechari Mudra, Vajroli Mudra, he was completely against. So he could have just said that it was complete rubbish, but then he would have been left with a lot of descriptions in different texts that actually mention Kundalini. If he had gone for the position of Sri Vaishnavism, as I showed coming in, in the Sankalpa Suryodaya from Vedanta Deshika, then that would have just said that Kundalini was Shashumna. Kundalini is Shashumna, it's the same thing. And that wouldn't really have worked when he was addressing a range of different Hatha Yoga texts. It wouldn't really have been a, a position that he could have very easily maintained. Uh, the Sri Vaishnava tradition doesn't seem to have very many explicitly Hatha Yoga texts certainly not using Kundalini in, in any sort of way. So I guess by going back to Pancharatra and Vaikarnasa, 
Krishnamacharya was being a traditionalist, going back to the roots of his Sri Vaishnava tradition, while rejecting what had for hundreds of years actually been the Sri Vaishnava position. So he was finding a way of being traditional and producing a, a conception of Kundalini that was actually arguable and actually useful in interpreting a range of different Hatha Yoga texts and in actually formulating his system. So, so he, he, had, he, he, he had a problem that had to be overcome and that's the way that he did it. So I think that he rejected the Shaiva descriptions, but he didn't completely reject Shaiva texts. So the Shiva Samhita and Giranda Samhita are taught in the tradition. They are texts that he, that he taught, but he was, he was critical about them. He, he didn't accept everything that they're taught. So I think Krishnamacharya was in, was in a, a bit of a bind and he got out of it by being both a very radical reformer, rejecting centuries of Sri Vaishnava tradition, but going back to the roots of Sri Vaishnava tradition. So he was a traditionalist and a reformer at the same time. Great. Well, thank you very much, Simon. That's, yeah, it's really, I mean, it's extremely um, uh, provocative material. There's so much to think about that comes out of, that comes out of your book. And, and I, I love the, all the different methodological approaches and the different angles you've taken on it. Uh, we've got, uh, mm -hmm. Unusually, instead of questions, we got got quite a lot of thanks coming in as well, saying thank you very much for, for your research. And um, yeah, we've gone over time. Just remains for me to say thank you very much. I don't know if we can do this the usual unmuting thing that we do. I can't. I have no idea. I'm not in charge of the. I'm not hosting. But I, I, anyway, I'd like to say thank you very much. That was great. And I'm going to reread your book. It's. I think there's still a lot. I mean, you've you've sort of really teased out all the Vaishnava side of 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 the of the uh, of the history of kundalini but to make full sense of it as well i think i'm gonna i think we need to take a deeper dive into the shiva material as well to try to work out how these things really did come together 